This episode could be triggering for sensitive listeners and contains mature content. It may not be suitable to all listeners. Should you need any emotional assistance, please see the show notes for telephone numbers that you can call. In South Africa, you can dial 116 to reach Childline or go to their website at childlinesa.org.za. This episode contains reference of child abuse, so please consider this before listening. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are my own and do not reflect the official policy or position of the podcast. Any content provided by contributors such as the host, guests, bloggers, sponsors or authors are of their opinion and are not intended to malign any religion, group, club, organization, company, individual, or anyone or anything. A Passage from Christ and the Holy Spirit, Two Turtle Doves by Lois I. Roden. Adam, created in the image of God, the Son, who was the image of his father, Eve, created in the image of God, the Holy Spirit, a feminine representation of God. Adam and Eve looked differently and were made differently. Therefore, they were created in the image of two different members of the Godhead, male and female, created he them. The Trinity, plural creators made the plural creation, male and female, with the promise of a son in Genesis 3.15. This is Decoding Cults, and I am your host, Palsy. You are listening to The Branch Davidians, Part 2. In this episode, we will look at the two factions that sprung from the Branch Davidians, and how they collided. We will also look at the life of a young man named Vernon Howell and how he rose up in the ranks and gained the trust of the followers. After the passing of Benjamin Roden, as one would expect, there was a struggle over who would lead the group. This time, it was between Lois, Ben's widow, and George, their son. George felt that he was the rightful leader, as he was chosen by his father. In his mind, he was the heir to the leadership, as he was the eldest son. As the SDA had female prophets, this male heir claim didn't hold very much water. The thing is, apparently not many people liked him. He was surly, quick to anger, and would throw fits. Some even described him as being an overgrown child. Although Lois liked the finer things in life, like new cars and fancy shoes, which went against their beliefs in modesty, she was still the lesser of two evils. Her claim to leadership was also backed up by one of the group's bylaws, which stated that the leader had to have a divinely inspired message and ministry, and, as she had had visions, and George did not, she became the leader of the group. In the book, A Journey to Waco, Autobiography of a Branch Davidian, Clive Doyle states, Even before Ben died, we regarded Lois as a prophet. Clive and his family had come to live on the compound all the way from Australia while Ben was still around. George contested this decision and demanded an election in 1979, but again lost to his mother. This infuriated George, as he was also not particularly happy with his mother's new female forward outlook. He started stealing items from the compound and selling them off, and even destroyed some of the property on the compound. He also wore weapons and threatened fellow congregants. Lois was at her wit's end, and ended up taking him to court. George was pretty confident that things would go his way, but in the end, 
the court decided that George was forbidden from ever becoming president of the group. He was further not allowed to interfere in any of the work of the association and could not possess or dispose of any of the church's assets. Lois took a further step in solidifying her leadership. She had a legal letter drawn up granting her full legal and financial control over the BDSDA's assets, which all of the members signed. This pissed George off even more. He packed up his things, moved to California, and started his own organization called the Branch Association. His sister Jane moved there with him. However, he did not cut ties completely, and he and his family would visit the compound from time to time. In my opinion, he was just keeping the channels of communication open with the group, biding his time to take over from when his mom would pass. Lois, as leader and having more feminist views, published Christ and the Holy Spirit to Turtle Doves in 1978. The dove reference comes from Leviticus 2 verse 8. If a woman cannot afford a lamb, she shall bring two doves or pigeons, one for a burnt offering and the other for a sin offering, and the priest shall perform the ritual to take away her impurity, and she shall be ritually clean. Lois travelled extensively throughout the US and Canada to get her message out. One of Lois's revelations was that the upside-down triangle within the Jewish cross was further proof of the female symbol for the Holy Spirit. In 1979, Lois started a new journal called Shikina. She, along with her co-editor and printer, Clive Doyle, would print her views in it and would also scour other news sources to find any news on women being ordained or any other pro-female Christian references that they could find and publish in this journal. Perry Jones would also serve as one of the journalists for the journal. Lois would receive awards for her writings from religious groups, one of these being the Award of Excellence from the Excellence in Media Angel Awards. In 1980, Lois announced that she would like to baptize all of the members living at the compound and those that were truly loyal that were in other parts of the country, even the world. She sent word out to those outside of the compound with a date when this was supposed to happen. Many people came to attend that service. George and his family also happened to be visiting over that time. When she asked his permission to baptize him with the rest of the group, he angrily stated that he didn't accept her message at all and stormed out of the service. Compound life was relatively stable for a time, and followers were quite happy going about their business and being able to worship in their own way without any outside influence. Then, in 1981, a skinny young man with long hair and aviator-style eyeglasses came to the compound to learn more about the branch. He was immediately drawn to the communal aspect of the compound, how happy everyone was to be there, and connected with Lois's view on femininity. Just a heads up, the next section contains references to child abuse and bullying. Some of the derogatory language used are direct quotes and not my own descriptions. Please ensure that you are okay to listen to this or skip ahead a few minutes. 14-year-old Bonnie Sue Clark met and fell in love with 19-year-old Bobby Wayne Howell in 1958. Towards the end of November, Bonnie realized that she was pregnant. During the pregnancy, Bobby left her for another teenage girl. On 17 August 1959, Bonnie gave birth to Vernon Wayne Howell in Houston, Texas. In an ABC News story, Bonnie said, He was a very cute and lovable boy, very inquisitive, a doer. She would also go on to describe how he loved to take things apart and figure out how they worked. Despite the description from his mom, to say that Vernon's early years were rough and rather unstable would be an understatement. 
Bonnie had married a violent alcoholic, and it is reported that this man would beat Bonnie and eventually young Vernon from the tender age of two. Bonnie left Vernon in the care of her parents around the age of four and moved to Dallas. Vernon's short time living with his grandparents seems to be one of the better parts of his life. His grandmother had two children shortly after Vernon had moved in. Although they were technically his uncle and aunt, they became like siblings to him. He even called his grandmama. In a Washington Post article, she described him as a bright and precocious child who liked to help around the house. She fondly remembers a time where little Vernon wanted to help out and proceeded to put the garden hose in the petrol tank of the car to try and fill it up. Vernon's grandfather was not very affectionate, which was not unusual for male parental figures at the time. His wife described him as a macho man country type Texan, but he did take Vernon hunting and fishing on the occasional weekend. At other times, Vernon would accompany his grand to church services at the Seventh-day Adventist church in their area. Unlike other children of his age, who would not be able to sit still during the service, it is said that Vernon would sit dead still and listen intently to what the preacher had to say. In the meantime, in Dallas, Bonnie had divorced her husband and met Roy Haldeman, whose nickname was Rocky, and married him. She then decided to fetch Vernon and bring him back to Dallas to live with them. In 1966, Bonnie and Rocky had a son named Roger, and some reports indicated that Rocky would show more attention and affection towards his own son. Vernon would later claim that Rocky would beat him severely when disciplining him, but Rocky and Bonnie would deny that this happened. His brother, however, in later accounts, would confirm that Vernon was abused and severely beaten by Rocky, and that even he was not immune from these beatings. It seems that he may not have had an altogether horrific time, as Sharon, his aunt, would describe visiting there and it being lovely. She even told a reporter from the Washington Post her most endearing memory of this time was looking out the car window as they drove away and seeing Vernon on his bicycle, pedaling furiously after the clocks, tears streaming down his face. It may also have been that the family didn't share their problems and kept up a happy face when the rest of the family came to visit. As they say, you never know what happens behind closed doors. When Vernon went to school, he struggled academically and failed grade 1 twice and grade 2 once. The school told his parents that he had a learning disability and a stress-induced stutter so they placed him in a class for learning disabled children. It turned out that Vernon had dyslexia. According to the Mayo Clinic, dyslexia is a learning disorder characterized by difficulty in reading. It occurs in children with normal vision and intelligence. Symptoms include late talking, learning new words slowly, and a delay in learning to read. Most children with dyslexia can succeed in school with tutoring or a specialized education program. Having dyslexia also does not mean that you can't succeed in life. People like Leonardo da Vinci, Walt Disney, and even Albert Einstein had it. The class that Vernon was placed in was smaller and lent itself to a more personalized way of teaching. Vernon finally started to do better. The thing is, sometimes people can be a bit cruel, and some of the children at school started teasing him, calling him either Vernie or Mr. Retardo. Other people around town would also refer to him as the half-wit. Obviously this hurt Vernon. He would go to his mother in tears. She would try to console him, explaining that he was smart, just in a different way but this did not comfort him or help his self-esteem. In his mind, his mom was supposed to say things like that. It only comforted him when his mother told him that he was obviously special to God. Vernon was an outcast and would spend time taking things apart, like radio to see how they worked, and he also gained a fondness for guns. 
When Vernon was 14, his family decided that it would be better for him to move back with his grandparents. They had moved to a new house, and even though there was plenty of room for him to stay inside the house, he asked if he could fix up the old shed in the back garden and live there. With permission, he fixed it up and his family described it as a cross between a typical teenager's room and a clubhouse. The walls were covered in posters of his favourite rock stars. While cleaning out the shed, Vernon found an old guitar. He took a few lessons and then carried on teaching himself to play. Vernon was very much into rock music. It was after all the 70s, and some of his favourites included Van Halen, Aerosmith and Eric Clapton. It turned out that Vernon didn't have a bad voice either. Girls throughout the neighbourhood would go and see this mysterious new guy who played guitar under the guise of visiting his aunt. She would later go on to say everyone that met Vernon liked him. It seemed like Vernon had finally found some stability and even some semblance of happiness during this time. Then, his grandfather decided that he could no longer stay at their house and he was sent back to his mother once again. In my opinion, having his family constantly shipping him off from one to another can't have been great for Vernon. I can only assume that this would have made him feel unwanted or a burden on them. A paper written by Sandra Huerta in 2013 for the Urban Institute outlays some effects of various types of instability on child development. Under family instability, she lists, Family instability is linked to problem behaviours and some academic outcomes, even at early ages. Children's problem behaviours further increase with the multiple changes in family structure. Family transitions that occur early in a child's development, prior to age 6, and in adolescence, appear to have the strongest effects. While young children need constant caregivers with who they can form secure attachments, adolescents need parental support, role models and continuity of residence and schools to succeed. Children demonstrate more negative behaviours when they lack the emotional and material support at home that they need to smoothly handle a family transition. Back in Dallas, Vernon still struggled with school and at the age of 16, he left public school and was enrolled at the SDA-run Dallas Junior Academy. Here again he struggled. I found references that not only was Vernon disputing with the teachers, but that he was also in a feud with his mother and stepfather. He dropped out of school again, this time in grade 10, and was shipped back to his grandparents. The one thing that was constant in his life was religion. Both his mother and grandmother were devout Seventh-day Adventists and he was exposed to Bible study and living by strict moral codes guided by the Ten Commandments. As Vernon had trouble reading, he set about learning the entire Bible off by heart. He started with the New Testament, which is the shorter of the two, and then would later also have the Old Testament committed to memory. It is also said that he would preach to his fellow classmates, but they thought him strange, and this did not endear him many friends. Vernon used his carpentry skills to gain work in construction. He managed to make an okay living doing this. By the time he was 18, he was playing in garage country bands, and had also saved up enough money to buy himself a brand new car. He also discovered bodybuilding and was said to be pumping up his biceps to the point where they almost looked too big for his lean frame. He would go to the local open-air pavilion, set up his amplifier and play his guitar for hours. Apparently he drew a small crowd during these sessions. Many younger boys, including his uncle Kenneth, looked up to him and would constantly ask him for advice about all sorts of topics. One evening, while Vernon was hanging out at the local arcade, he was approached by 16-year-old Linda Campion, who asked him for a lift home. It is said that Vernon was at first hesitant to do this, as he found her too beautiful. In my opinion, 
I think he may have found her super attractive and may have wanted to sleep with her, but with his religious upbringing, including no premarital sex, it might have been too much of a temptation for him. He eventually said that he'd give her a lift and then took her home and just dropped her off. Nothing untoward happened during this encounter and he had convinced himself that he was stronger than his desires. He went over to her house the next evening for a visit, except this time, as they were talking in her bedroom, well, one thing led to another, and they ended up having sex. Texas law states that the age of consent is 17, but it also states that a girl can marry as young as 14 as long as she has parental consent. Racked with guilt over having committed adultery, Vernon left Dallas. He received a phone call from Linda telling him that she was pregnant. Vernon's immediate response was that he was sterile and it could not be his child. After this call though, he struggled internally with the issue. He had come to the realization that God had put this child in his life and that as he and Linda had been together, she was technically his wife. Following this revelation, he decided to return to Dallas and accept his responsibility. When he finally arrived at the doorstep of the Campions, he learned that Linda had had an abortion. Despite this, Linda's parents allowed Vernon to move in and even sleep in her bedroom. Soon after, Linda fell pregnant again, and her father kicked Vernon out of the house and refused him any further contact with the family. Vernon would later state that shortly after this, he was sitting outside looking at the stars when God spoke to him. It boiled down to the fact that the rejection that Vernon had faced from this girl was nothing compared to the rejection that God had gotten from Vernon for 19 years. He said that this had brought him back to God. He left Dallas and moved back to Chandler, where his grandparents, aunt and uncle lived. He started attending church again with his aunt. Things seemed to go well for him again, and he even got baptized into the church. He also heard about the branch and Lois Roden, who had the gift of prophecy. He wanted to go out to Waco and learn more, but there was never an opportune time for him to go. Vernon started attending a series of revival meetings called Revelation Seminars. These sessions included disturbing images in a multimedia portrayal of Armageddon. This really intrigued him. Vernon started to take his belief to an extreme and would even take over some of the sermons, which did not sit well with the elders. Vernon had told his aunt that it was time to have a new prophet and a new light in the church. He said that he may even be that person. He also then alleged that in the years before, he had skipped school one day, went to church and prayed to God. He said that apparently God had spoken to him not in words, but in pictures in his heart, that convinced him that God was there. A part of this message was that he was to become a prophet of God. It was also here that Vernon became obsessed with the seven seals as mentioned in the book of Revelations. This would become key later in his teachings. Eventually he became disavowed by the church for his lifestyle and divergent views. He went on to California. Here, he tried his hand at becoming a rock star, but being a relatively talented musician in a place filled with talented musicians, he didn't make it. In 1981, Vernon turned his sights on Texas and drove to Waco to find the Mount Carmel compound and the Branch Davidians. In one account that I found, Vernon had begged Lois to let him join as he was in the grips of a terrible vice which was excessive masturbation. Vernon was welcomed at the compound and found the teachings very much in line with what he believed in. Given his background in carpentry, he asserted himself as a handyman around the compound and set about fixing things that were in bad need of repair. This endeared him to those people who lived there. He would also play his guitar and sing at the church services. Vernon even recruited his uncle Kenneth to join him. They rented an apartment and worked construction jobs to pay the bills. In their spare time, they would recruit more members. 
As Vernon was a cool young guy, he managed to reach a younger audience and brought them into the fold. He spent as much time as he could at the compound and made two very significant connections. The first was a devout follower of the Davidians called Perry Jones. Perry Jones, a long-time and respected member of the group, would also join Vernon and Kenneth on recruitment drives. He will become important a bit later in the story, but the second and most important connection was Lois Roden. She took him under her wing and started tutoring him. When he had gotten to the compound, he kind of had a clean slate, so he didn't let on that he had memorized the entire Bible. He claimed that he had no previous knowledge of the Bible and that the reason that he learned so quickly must have been divine inspiration. It is said that Vernon would spend hours talking to Lois about his interpretation of the Bible and the visions that he had. He would even later claim that he had started teaching her. In November of 1982, Lois had finally gotten permission from all of the relevant parties in Israel to bury her late husband's remains on the sacred ground of the Mount of Olives. She then obtained permission from the Texas Department of Health to have his body removed from the mausoleum. It was then shipped to New York and from there a funeral home helped transport him to his final resting place. Vernon accompanied Lois on this trip. Lois would later state in an interview about her husband's final resting place that it was a real history-making event in her life. Vernon was very well liked within the community and was always helping fix and improve things around the compound. He also started to place himself more prominently within the group, taking over some of the services. I don't think Lewis minded too much. One of the reasons will be a bit clear in a few minutes. But I think the big reason for this was that she was getting on in years. She may not have had the stamina to keep leading an ever-growing flock. There are some reports that say that she had named him her successor. In my opinion, I think she didn't trust her own son to uphold her values and knew that he wasn't very well liked. He may have ruined everything that she had worked so hard to build. It may also be because the same bylaws that kept her in command, the one which stated only a prophet could lead the group, basically gave the mantle to Vernon, as he had also claimed to get messages from God. Some of the followers started to suspect that Vernon, in his early 20s, had begun a sexual relationship with Lewis, now in her late 60s. One account even stated that Vernon had claimed that she was like Sarah from the Bible. If you recall in the episode I covered about the MRTCG, Sarah was the wife of Abraham, who had not borne him any children. He prayed to God and God promised him that not only would she bear a child, but she would be the mother of nations. Sarah at first did not believe that it was possible, but at the age of 90, she gave birth to their son Isaac. Vernon allegedly used the story to claim that Lois would have a child with him and that this child would be the chosen one. This would also not be the only time that Vernon would make statements about fathering special children. Vernon also started to take over more of the administrative duties that the leader would normally do. By 1983, he had told Lois that she needed to stop publishing her journal. Against his wishes, she published a final copy of Shekinah with a picture of herself in it. Unfortunately, this was an unflattering picture that made it look as if she had two black eyes. When David saw this, he said to her, You are supposed to be the eyes of the church. You are the seer. You are the prophet. And this picture signifies symbolically that you are blind. He further went on to state, that she had lost all of her wisdom and inspiration as a result of being disobedient to God. He also leant into the rumor of their sexual relations and used this to dethrone her. He told people that he had indeed made her pregnant because of his strength of faith, but because her faith was waning, she had had a miscarriage. Despite all of this, she still believed that Vernon was supposed to lead the group. 
Word had gotten back to George about Vernon, and the fact that he may become the new leader within the group, with the full backing of Lois. Not surprisingly, George was upset by this. At first, George tried to get his mother away from the compound. He convinced his sister to call Lois and tell her that she was dying. According to Clive Doyle, Vernon said, The Lord showed me that this is a ruse. This is not something you should do. But this was, after all, her own flesh and blood child, so Lois ignored him and went to California anyway. Upon arriving there, she realized that it was just a ploy to get her off the property, and she immediately returned to Mount Carmel. George then moved back to Waco. He and his family lived in a caravan next to the driveway close to the entrance of the compound. Lois did not have the energy to kick him off of the property. She may have already been of ill health by this time, or she just didn't have the fight in her anymore. George had heard about the rumours of the sexual relationship between his mother and Vernon and thought that he could use this to get rid of him. He went to the local police and later charged against Vernon of elder abuse, stating that he was sexually abusing Lois and brainwashing her. Then he went and filed a lawsuit at federal court. Nothing came from this either. He started talking to people on the compound, trying to discredit Vernon by stating that he is the devil and that Lois is carrying the devil's baby. Not many people paid attention to his ramblings though. In our next episode, we will look at the showdown that happens between these two men, not once, but twice. And then we will see who ends up on top. If you enjoyed this episode, please hit the subscribe button and rate and review us. It will go a long way into improving the podcast and help other people find it. You can find us on Facebook and you can email us at decodingcults at gmail.com. We would love to hear from you. If there are any topics around the workings of cults which you would like further explanation on, or if there is a cult that you want to hear about, please email me or post it in the Facebook group. Remember to go and check out By Design Crafts SA and if you order, tell them I sent you for a 5% discount. The amazing logo art was created by the tattoo artist Jock Jacobs. Thank you so much for listening.